our next blacksmith has a different outlook on how to create, and uh, you'll see why. My name is Dave and I'm a blacksmith knife maker. Uh, I work out of Cross Art Forge on Vancouver Island. Um, when I was 14, I started knife making. Um, I was living in Calgary at the time and we did a, a unit in school in Japan. And I was really intrigued by the samurai lifestyle and the ethic and especially by the metalwork and the, the incredible work that goes into a Japanese sword. Yeah, not everybody needs a, needs a Japanese sword in the forest on Vancouver Island, although some people do. Um, but what I've been doing is uh, using the Japanese tanto as the foundation for my work. When I started making knives, I was a teenager or young teenager, so there was no cash to put into the project. So I started by working with scrap metal from my grandparents' farm. Um, but as I, as I did that, I realized that for me, part of the story of a, of a finished work is where it came from and what the steel was in its former life. So as I realized how important that was to me, I've actually come to a place where I don't buy any, any metal or any wood or any steel for any of my projects because there's so much out there that's just rusting away some piece of farm equipment or some scrap wood that's coming from some other local process. And to me, if I can put that stuff to work, those little pieces that no one else can really use, that's one more element of story to my work, as well as kind of closing a loop of, of not, you know, wasting or, or buying stuff we don't need to. So my process, uh, once I've found a piece of steel that looks like it might work, um, is I will, I'll first test a little piece of it and see if it will harden. That tells me if there's enough carbon in it to make a knife. So I'll forge it out thin and heat it up and quench it in water, and if it snaps, when I hit it with a heavy hammer, then I know that it's got enough carbon. And where it breaks, I can look at the grain of the steel and see how, how the quality is. Working the steel in this fashion is hard and laborious. The metal remains solid, and each stroke does little to change that. Okay. You're like a power hammer. Um, so at that point, then, I can take a piece of it and begin to forge it out but it's all done by hand, the hand hammer. And there's kind of two stages. Uh, first to forge it into the Sunobe form, which is the, a rectangular blank, which sort of distributes the amount of steel for the blade and the tang, and sort of determines the dimensions. And then after that, forge it into the shape of the blade. When we moved back from Japan four years ago, I kind of started with the question, how did they make knives 100 years ago or 500 years ago? And is it possible for me to do that? And so it, it started just simply with, well, can I do all the work by hand hammering instead of using a power hammer? Or um, can I use a pine sap resin instead of epoxy glue? How many of the modern things can I replace? 
but it it kind of led to further and further until the point where I realized I I don't have to use a grinder or a sander if I learn to forge well and then I can do all my finishing by hand filing. I'm working at the edge here so that I don't put the corner of the hammer into the anvil because it's kind of wedge shaped and as I work this edge down this thing wants to become a banana and curve up so I'm always fighting that by resetting it, straightening it. And uh, to the point where now I'm basically off the grid in my shop and I can say pretty much from start to finish I'm doing 13th century knife making using 13th century techniques and, and materials. So I, I don't use any propane, I don't use any mineral coal, we make all our own charcoal. Everything that would have been done 500 years ago, 700 years ago, is the way I do it. So hand files, hand saw, hand hammering, polishing stones, uh, mill epoxy, all the stuff that we take for granted. Um, it's possible to live without, but it's a lot more work. <laughs> it's, I think it's tempting as a, as a maker to, to try and quickly get through a lot of work, but um, my wife has always reminded me, if you're gonna make something, make it the best that you possibly can at this point. Don't make something that will sell, just good enough to sell, but make something that should be in a museum. And so, I don't know, but there is the potential that someday my work will end up in a museum because, because real materials last if they're taken care of. Somebody, lifetimes from now, could still be using one of my knives or could still be caring for it. So my goal now is to make things that almost look as if they should be in a museum, both because they're well finished, but also because of the, all the materials and the techniques that I use are historical. Fine slivers of discarded material fall away to reveal the true nature of the steel. Scraping the steel gives me a glimpse into the scope of dedication you need for this type of work. Like, I know it's, uh, it's metal, but it's just so delicate, right? Like, I don't want to put any deep grooves that you're going to end up having to... <laughs> so after the, the forging is all done, I'll clean up the shape with a file and get everything kind of trued up. And then at that point, it's still not considered a blade. It's still just a piece of steel shaped like a blade. And so the critical moment when the blade is born is when it's hardened. And a, a Japanese sword has two different hardness zones in the blade. The edge will be very, very hard, which makes a good cutting edge, but is somewhat brittle. And then the rest of the blade will be a t really tough type of steel. And it's not two pieces of steel, it's just two different steel crystals within the same blade. And that's caused by the, the process of hardening, which is unique to Japanese swords. And to do that, um, you coat the back of the blade with a thin layer of clay and that acts, acts as an insulation layer so that when you plunge the hot steel into water, the edge cools really quickly and the rest of it cools about half a second later. And that little difference is all it takes to give you the, the two different hardnesses. Um, the only problem with it is it's a very stressful procedure on the steel. And so sometimes when you quench a blade, it'll, it'll crack and that's it after 10, 12 hours of work it's lost, the whole, the whole project is back to square one. So at this stage, if I overheat a spot, then it's undone all of that careful low temperature forging we've done, so that's why the temperature is so important at this stage for a lot of the reasons. Hours upon hours have been poured into this single piece, and the final heat treatment is at hand. 
Day's face is a mask of concentration. One false action could result in failure. Smith, that's the moment when you either have a blade or you've done it all for nothing. I would say that's the point where there's the most risk and stress, but it's also the point where there's the most joy because if you succeed, you've got a blade and the rest of it is safe sailing from there. For me, the steel is the heart of the whole project, so um, finding good steel is really important to me and uh, what I'm aiming for when I'm hunting for steel is to find something that's as close to Japanese tamahagane steel as I can find and the main uh, characteristics of it that I'm looking for is it's low alloy so especially manganese I don't want a lot of modern alloys which means it needs to be more than a hundred years old so once it's hard um, then the rest of the work is taking uh, the blade to different stones and taking off the extra steel, cleaning it all up and polishing it. And uh, if you use a, a Japanese polishing stone, a natural stone from Japan, it will actually show you those two different hardness layers as you polish. And you can see that line. Um, usually it's the wavy line on the samurai sword. That's brought out just by polishing with, with the right kind of stones. Waiting for the water dance. Okay, harder than I like, but let's see what it did on the stones here. To me, because I'm working with a piece of steel that has a history already of being made 150 years ago, of being some tool or some part of you know, an old carriage for somebody on a farm for decades and then for lying in the field for more decades. That story is really important to me and I kind of want to honor that with what I do with the steel. But when you polish a piece of uh, Japanese sword steel, you can still see the texture in it from the layers of the folding. And uh, if you go back 150 years, you can still find pieces of steel in the West that were made in a similar way that have layers and when you polish them, you can see the grain of the steel, which is really neat to me. Um, another thing that I do for the mounting the blades is, uh, as much as possible, I use reclaimed and local materials. So instead of importing the, the Japanese wood that's traditionally used for the sword, I found a local wood that's really similar as far as properties. So I'm a, as a bladesmith, I'm aware that every time I pull the piece of steel out of the fire, every time I hammer it, Every operation I do is, is potentially changing the character of that steel for good or for ill. So as I control the temperature and the way that I forge it and the way that I shape it, I'm actually contributing to the long history that that steel has and hopefully turning it into something even better than it was. When I'm finishing a knife, I will, I'll, polish, I'll do the rough polish just to the point where the blade has its final geometry. And then I'll do all the woodwork, building the other metal fittings. And then the very last thing I do once the knife is, has been completely built is the final polish. And the final polishing takes almost as long as all the other polishing together. And it's just a working with finger stones to bring out the, the temper line, the hammon, and show the grain of the steel. And that's, that's kind of when the whole project comes together and you finally get to see what was in the steel hiding all along and, and see it with the rest of the components. So that's, um, that's also a big moment. Um, and for me, making something out of real materials is very rewarding because when it's done, it's done. And someone can take care of that for longer than my lifetime. History flows like molten metal. Archaic tools gather dust to the point of legend. But is this the end?
I would like the legacy of my work not to be that I produced a lot of stuff, but that each piece that I produced is um, a work of art unto itself and something that someone would want to care for and pass to the next generation. So that's always kind of the framework for my work. Is this at a level where I'm happy with letting it go out into the world? And if not, I need to go back to the workbench and keep working on it. Blacksmithing, ironworking, metal sculpting, all these ancient techniques are still alive and well in our world today. And sure, you may have to come to a, a park like Heritage Park to see it in action as it was in the old days. I think that as long as there's artisans innovating, creating, there's still a chance for us to see the soul of steel. <laughs>